you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Romans, chapter 14. Book of Romans, chapter 14. And since it's the 4th of July weekend, I believe it's providential that we will be in Romans chapter 14 and we'll be talking about the subject of liberty today. However, the liberty that we're going to discuss is a little bit different from the freedoms that we enjoy as Americans, but I believe that it'll be uh, a message that, that is good for, for us today. So let's go, Lord, in prayer as we begin. Father, thank you for your goodness to us, and God, thank you that you have indeed uh, bless this nation, God, that you have given grace, and really, in many ways, God, given grace where it has not been deserved in any way, shape, or form, God. We think about the founding of our nation. We think about uh, how at one time that uh, there were so many that were committed to you, God, and then we look at where we are today, and we realize that we have work to do. And God, I I want to pray as I did in the early service, God, I want to pray for revival. We need a revival to sweep this nation. God, we need people to see that uh, the evil one is uh, working today in in a powerful way, God, and is affecting the minds of of people. And uh, Lord, we need you to, to step in, Lord, to convict of sin and to lead people to a place of decision to be saved. And so, God, we we love you. We ask you to do what only you can do. And God will be so careful to thank you for it. Bless our time today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A Christian is out at a local restaurant, and they choose to order a non-alcoholic strawberry daiquiri, they are worried that someone from church might see them and think that they're drinking an alcoholic drink. A Christian listens to music that does not have a bad message, but would not necessarily be classified as Christian music. A Christian purchases goods from a convenience store that also sells pornography behind the counter. A Christian uses a service provider or buys goods from a store that annually donates money to anti-Christian causes. A Christian stands in line at a movie theater to buy a ticket. Some church members walk by and that member wonders if they will think that he is going to see a a movie that is is lewd and, and, and not clean. We're talking about Christian liberty. And whenever you talk about the idea of Christian liberty, uh, you have different questions that arise. One question is, uh, is it possible for a Christian to have too much liberty? Another question might be, should I even care what other people think about me, and especially what other Christians might think about me? Now, on the surface, this might seem like it's, it's very simple. You might already have a decision one way or the other, but as you get down into the thoughts behind it, you realize that it's not always an easy matter to decide. How do I know what to do? How do you know if you are the one that should make the change or if the person who is offended by what you are doing is just being unreasonable. And so in essence, this issue touches every facet of the Christian life. And you might believe that you're a pretty conservative person. You know, you might say, well, Pastor, I I feel like I follow the Bible and I come to church and I I serve the Lord. I feel like I'm pretty conservative, you know, and and, uh, I doubt that there are many people in the church who would be as conservative as, as I am. But the longer that you're a Christian, the more you realize that, you know, there are, there are people that come and, and everybody draws their lines in different places. Not everybody draws their line in the same place. So you might have somebody that comes along and, 
and you think you're pretty conservative, but maybe they're more conservative uh, than you are, and something that you're doing someone might find to be offensive. And so today we want to discuss Christian liberty and, and really gain some insight about what it is and perhaps what its limitations should be. And so as we get started this morning, the first thought to consider is this thought, and that is the importance of unity over personal differences. The importance of unity over personal differences. And if you have your Bibles there, we're going to begin in verse 1 of Romans chapter 14. And the Bible says, Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. Now, we, we've talked about this a little bit before. Uh, you know, back then, you know, there were special diets, dietary customs, or, you know, it, you had a situation that took place where uh, you would have uh, meat that had been offered to idols, had been used in idol uh, worship to worship false gods. And so the thought there is, you know, th these... Uh, these worshipers of, of these false gods, after they had sacrificed these animals, uh, they would take the meat and they would put that meat in the market to sell. And maybe they would mark the price down you know, on that in order to be able to, uh, to sell it. And there were some that would say, oh, yeah, man, that's a sale, right? I'm going to buy that. But you would have others who maybe at one time had partaken in that idol worship, and so for them it was it was a very personal issue, because at one time they were involved with that. So they would say, "I, I can't I can't purchase that meat, or I cannot eat that meat because you know it's been offered to idols." Okay, and so that was kind of the other thought, you know, that was there. It says, "And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him." And so as Christians, we are not bound to the standards of man, but we are bound to the standards of God. And everyone that becomes a Christian later in life brings a certain amount of baggage, or we might even want to say a certain amount of, of knowledge with him or her. And sometimes it is very apparent, and sometimes it is not very apparent. We think about things like religious baggage, you know, traditions, rituals, maybe from a former church, a system or denomination. You know, maybe you belong to another church at one time and then you come to Hellsford and you say, well, gee, you know, I mean, I, I like this church and I enjoy coming here, but they don't do things the way that I was used to, you know, at my previous church. Or, you know, uh, sometimes you'll hear things like that with regards to denomination. Well, yeah, I know that this is a Baptist church, but you know what, I used to be uh, Methodist, or I used to be Presbyterian, or I used to be non-denominational, or whatever, you know, so, and, uh, you know, there there are some people who would just absolutely not come to a, a church because of the denominational name tag that is on the sign of that church. Maybe it's a habitual baggage, maybe it's addictions, or profanity, or alcoholism, or some kind of uh, addiction uh, that was there. Maybe it's an ethnic baggage, uh, again, certain dietary laws, certain clothing standards, certain customs. Maybe it's a parental baggage. You know, sometimes we are, we are very strong in our beliefs that we should hold on to the things that we were taught by our parents, and that could be a good thing. Listen, as long as we were taught what was right, right? But sometimes... We weren't always taught everything that was right, and yet we'll still hold on to that belief even if it goes against what the Bible says. Maybe it's an institutional baggage, you know, maybe from a, a particular college or a former uh, career that you had, but you're carrying that institutional baggage with you. But knowledge can be a good thing, and I, I'm, I'm not here to slam knowledge. We talked about this on Wednesday night uh, here in our adult Bible study uh, on the Holy Spirit. And we were talking about this idea of, of, of knowledge. And knowledge can be good as long as it is the right knowledge, first of all, 
But then secondly, as long as our reason for acquiring that knowledge is, is right. Because sometimes, you know, our reasoning for acquiring knowledge is just simply, you know, so that we can know more than somebody else. And if that is our mentality, if that is the reason why we are acquiring knowledge, then that's only going to cause us to be puffed up with pride. And we know that the Bible says that God hates pride. And so in verse 1, when Paul says not to dispute over the thing, the thought is that we should receive someone who is weak in the faith and not get sidetracked with arguments and debates, listen, that will definitely come with receiving this type of person. If you receive somebody who is weak in their faith and, you know, they're in the process of growing, but they have certain beliefs, they have certain ritualistic beliefs, they have certain standards that they have formed, you know, and, and they're not necessarily biblical, but they are what they have, then it is quite possible, and, and really it's, it's more than likely, that they are going to at some point look to impose those views on you. And, the, but, and yet the Bible says we are to receive someone who, who is weak in the faith. In the church at Rome, there was a group who Paul said was weak, who believed in keeping special diets and keeping special holy days. Okay, again, remember, holidays comes from the words of holy days, okay? And so they would keep special holidays. And I believe that there are, there are many people who enjoy having really a ritualistic system to go by because it makes them feel safe, okay? Nothing wrong with that. It makes them feel safe. It makes them, uh, you know, feel like that uh, it's something that can provide an outlet for them uh, in their faith. It's a way for them to worship the Lord. And, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with that unless they are seeking to impose that ritualistic system on somebody else. On the other side, there was another group, which was the strong. And in the church, uh, in this church, they understood that they had liberty in Christ. The problem is they were not afraid to flaunt the liberty that they had in Christ, even if that meant the detriment for those who were weaker in their faith. And so God tells the strong, listen, not to despise the weak, but he tells the weak not to judge the strong, okay? And so the weak would judge the strong because it made them feel and look more spiritual, and the strong would despise the weak because in their mind it would be like saying, look, I've already got a Holy Spirit. I don't need another Holy Spirit, right? Have you ever met that brother or sister in Christ that just felt like God had given them the gift of criticism? Right? They just felt like it was, it was their calling in life to come and to criticize you, to tell you what you were uh, not doing right and, and all the things that you're doing wrong. And listen, there are, there are people that actually feel that way and it's kind of like that that younger sibling right when you were growing up you know the one that's nipping at your heels and following you around and and they're telling you everything you're doing wrong and how they're going to tell mom and dad you know what you did wrong and you just you, you just come to despise them you're like come on get, just leave me alone right and that's what was happening there at the church at Rome and so Paul is telling them that they need to learn to come together first in unity they need to come together in unity. And this is going to do a couple of things, okay? First of all, it will bring discipline to the strong to not abuse the liberty that they have in Christ and do damage to their brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay? It's, you know, it, it's easy just to tell somebody to go away, right? Somebody walks in the door and maybe they are disheveled, you know, they, their, their hair doesn't look nice, you know, maybe they're dirty, they're, 
their clothes are dirty, uh, you know, maybe, you know, that person has body odor or something like that. You know, it's easy just to, to say to that person, you know what, maybe you wouldn't feel comfortable here. Maybe you would feel comfortable going somewhere else. And then they get the hint and then they leave and, and in your, your mind and in your heart, you think, you know, it really was the best for them, you know. That really was best for them. You know, they, they need to go somewhere where, you know, it's a better fit, right? But really, we're not concerned about what's best for them. We're thinking about, well, what's best for me? And what we're really thinking about is, you know, if, if I mean, what if, if this person comes in? My goodness, what if, what if someone else comes in? That is this the same. As a matter of, what if a group of people come in that are the same? What would we do? And you know what? I think God would say that's a great problem for us to have. Right? Oh, Lord, I just don't know if that'd be a good fit. Why? Because you don't want to take the time to invest in that person's life. You don't want to take the time to help them become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Right? But for the grace of God, we'd be in the exact same situation. Right? We'd be in the, the exact same situation. And I'm just simply saying, man, you know, we, we, need to, we need to be thoughtful. And we need to make sure that we are not doing anything to abuse the liberty that we have and do damage to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Second, it'll help the weak to grow up and not be so judgmental all the time. You know, it's okay to, to be, become a, a baby Christian, you know, to first to get saved. And the Bible talks about, you know, drinking milk and not strong meat. And, uh, you know, that, that's okay. But there comes a time where you, you've got to grow up. There comes a time where we have to mature in our faith to the place where, you know, we are full grown, where we are able to take on that strong meat. You know, we don't want to stay babes in Christ. We don't want to continue to be weak in our faith. And so, you know, that's a principle in God's word that if you have people who are weak in the faith, that those who are stronger should help to bring them along, to help them to mature in their faith. And I'm going to tell you something right now. That God wants unity in the church. But I'm going to tell you something. The devil wants disunity in the church. Did you know that? He wants disunity. Man, he likes it when he says, you know, that the strong you know, are despising the weak and that the weak are judging the strong. Man, the devil loves that because that gives him an open door. That gives him a foothold to be able to get in the church and stir up the pot and keep people from being unified. And he loves it. And what I'm saying and what I believe Paul is saying here is we need to shut the door on the devil. You know, we need to shut the door. And we don't give him a place to get his foot in the door, but we shut the door. How do we do that, Pastor Polston? We do that by loving each other. We love that by being unified with one another. We do that by understanding, hey, listen, not all of us are the same, right, in our Christian walk. All of us are at different places at different times. And we need to be thoughtful of those who don't believe or are not exactly like us. I mentioned this in the early service. You know, Brother Keith's got a difficult job. Because, you know, when it comes to music choices, not everybody's the same. Right? Amen or on me, right? And you have some people who come to church and they say, well, I just believe that it should all be about hymns and we should, just, we should only sing hymns. And I, I just believe that that's the way it should be. And you have some others that come in and say, well, I, you know, that's not my preference. I really like kind of that praise and worship, you know, style of, 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 of music. And, and, and that's really what speaks to me. And the person who, who loves the hymns, they'll say, yeah, but the hymns, man, they, they have so much rich doctrine that is in there, and they're absolutely right. There's a lot of rich doctrine in the hymns. And then the other folks will say, well, yeah, and I agree with that, but you know what? 
man, when I sing the hymns, I feel like I'm singing about God. But when I sing the praise and worship songs, I feel like I'm singing directly to God. And so you see that there, is, there, are, there are good thoughts on both sides. And it's not that, that one is necessarily better than the other, but people think that it is. And so if you're a Christian and, and you don't, you know, you, only, you, you, you sing the praise and worship, but you don't care as much for the hymns, well, there must be something wrong with you, right? You must not be a very mature Christian yet. And if you were more mature, then, you know, you would be. And see, you, those games get played around in the church. And what we need to understand is what, what is the heart behind what you're singing? Because that's what God's looking at. Amen? That's what God is looking at. You know, you, you, you think we're going to get to church or get to heaven one day, and we think we know what the music is going to be like in heaven. And I got news for you. I think the music is going to be probably different from anything we've ever heard in our entire life. And there will probably be instruments in heaven that never existed here on earth. And I, I share this with the early crowd, you know, I'm, I'm praying for a glorified singing voice. You know, when, when all, we all get our new bodies, you know, one day I hope that I'll be able to sing. Uh, you know, that would be great if everybody had the ability to do that. But I, I'm just simply saying, you know, the devil loves to grab a hold of these, these things in the church. And he likes to try to start Christians fussing and fighting, right? About the music, about the, about, you know, I, I, I mentioned earlier about a, a church I heard of that split because they couldn't agree on the color of the carpet, right? Well, we're getting new carpet. One group wants it red and one group wants it blue. And you know what? One day we're going to, if that's the way that we think, one day we're going to have to hang our head in glory when we stand before the Lord and we stop and think back, you know what? Man, it, it, was it really worth it? To, to, to wound my brother or sister in Christ because I wanted my way? Was it really worth it? And we need to stop and think about that. Now, another thought to consider today is the importance of letting God be God. The importance of letting God be God. Look at verses 4 and following. The Bible says, Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regards the day regards it unto the Lord. And he that regards not the day to the Lord, he does not regard it. He that eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God the thanks. And he that eats not to the Lord, he eats not and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and no man dies to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. And so again, we fuss over these things that have no eternal value. And there are certain things that we believe are important that are not really that important, except, listen, except that we place love and devotion behind it. And that's what God is concerned about, is our love and devotion. Now, should our, the things we do be biblical? Absolutely. But it is interesting when you look into the church and, and some of these things that we fuss about, you don't see anything really that, that is talked about uh, regarding these things, and, and I believe that's because, you know, really God wanted to give a wide berth, you know, because you are dealing with different people, and you are dealing pe with, with people that have different backgrounds. And so, you know, God is concerned about the devotion that is behind the things that we do. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Kings 15. 1 Kings chapter 15. I want you to see this because this is good. In 1 Kings 15, let me begin in verse number 9. This is about King Asa. It says, In the 20th year of Jeroboam, 
king of Israel, Asa became king over Judah. And he reigned 41 years in Jerusalem. His grandmother's name was Makkah, and uh, the, the granddaughter of Abishalom. And Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did his father David. And he banished the perverted persons from the land and removed all the idols that his fathers had made. So he removed Makkah, his grandmother, from being queen mother because she had made an obscene image of Asherah. And Asa cut down her obscene uh, image and burned it by the, the brook Kidron. But the high places were not removed. Nevertheless, Asa's heart was loyal to the Lord all of his days. He also brought into the house of the Lord the things which his father had dedicated and the things which he himself had dedicated, silver and gold and utensils. And so this is a powerful scripture because King uh, Asa began to clean up Judah. And God saw this as good because the Bible says that Asa did what was right in the sight of the Lord. And so I want you to, to think about it this way. If, 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 the, if the Lord said that he did what was right, then we need, need to go and, and say, okay, well, then what did he do? Well, it's interesting here. It says, first, the Bible, the Bible tells us he banished the perverted persons from the land. Do you know what that word perverted means? You might have it in your King James Bible. It literally means sodomites. Okay? It literally means sodomites. And he banished the sodomites from the land. Next, he removed all of his father's idols, and he took away his grandmother's high status because she made an obscene idol of Asherah. Asherah was, was actually a false goddess. Uh, she was the goddess of fertility, and, and really, the Hebrews, you have to understand that, you know, that was something that, especially in the Old Testament, you see God having to deal with time and time again. You know, that they should be monotheistic, meaning the belief in the one true God, but you, you, you constantly see this idea of polytheism coming back, a belief in many gods, and, and, and God constantly having to deal with his people because of the worship of, of many gods. And so... You know, this goddess Asherah was supposed to be like a consort for God Almighty. And King Asa came along and said, no, that's not right. And the Bible teaches that he cut down uh, this, this image and that he burned it with fire. And then finally, the Bible says that Asa brought offerings of gold and silver to the Lord. Now, we understand that, you know, God's not up in heaven needing gold and silver, right? You know, that's not, that's not what the Bible is saying there. What it's saying is, is that when it talks about him bringing the gold and silver, the thought there is, you know, it is something that is precious to human beings. And so as they, they you know, King Asa brings that with a heart of love and worship and sacrifice, then, then God accepts that love. God accepts that devotion, even though God doesn't need money. And so when we think about Asa, I mean, when, when you read this, the, the thought there is that everything is awesome. You know, Asa is this, this man of God, except for one little thing. It says there, if you go back and, and look at verse 14, it says, but the high places were not removed. The high places were not removed. Well, you say, well, what's, what's the big deal about the high places? The high places were hills that were artificially constructed to be able to worship false gods. And the Lord said, you know, Asa, you, you, your heart is loyal to me. Asa, you, you have done what is right in the sight of the Lord. You know, it's kind of like when, the, remember, the rich young ruler came to Jesus and, and he said, but one thing that you're lacking, you know, it's kind of this, this thought, you know, but there's one thing, you know, there's one thing you didn't do. I would have liked to have seen you tear down those high places that were used for the pagan worship. You know, you didn't do that. But Asa, I know that you love me. I know that your heart is for me. 
and you did what was right in my sight. By the way, you know, Solomon, for all of his wisdom, uh, you know, he had many foreign wives, and Solomon actually built many of these high places so that his foreign wives could worship in those places. So for all of his wisdom, you know, Solomon, you know, did some foolish things, you know, when it came to his worship of the one true God. But, but here's what I want you to see. God was still pleased with him. And, and, and here's what I want you to get when we bring this back to Romans 14. You know, we criticize another brother or sister in Christ. But Paul said, who are you to criticize another man's servant? And really what Paul is saying there is he's saying, who do we think we are to criticize God's servant? Right? Boy, that's something we need to think about. I was, um, I was thinking about it this way. A Christian might say, God, I'm choosing to go on a special diet and I'm going to observe special holidays just for you. And God says, great, I didn't ask you to do all of that, but if that's a way for you to show your love for me, then that's great. I, I will accept your love and devotion in doing those things. And then the person says, okay, God, but no one else is doing what I'm doing. And if they really loved you, they would be doing what I'm doing. And so I know that the Holy Spirit is very busy, and so I'm going to deputize myself to be like the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to go around and I'm going to tell others that they need to be doing what I'm doing. And Paul says, you and I, we don't have the right to dictate to someone else how they are supposed to love and worship God, that is between that person and the Lord. That person is not your servant. That person is God's servant. And you might say, well, they won't abstain from eating meat that has been offered to idols, so that must mean that they have a soft spot in their heart for idol worship. No, that just means that... Uh, they don't believe that there's any other God but the one true God. And so it doesn't matter whether the meat has been offered to idols or not. Right? They don't have any problem eating it. Well, you know, they don't observe certain holidays and they need to observe special holidays, you know, and uh, if they don't do that, then, then, you know, they must be showing that they don't really have a heart for the Lord. And, well, no, it, it might just mean that every day, is considered to be holy to them. They wake up every day with, with grateful hearts, thanking the Lord that they still have air in their lungs and they have a heart beating in their chest and they give glory to God. You, you see how it's possible that we can construct a system and then try to fit everybody else into our system? Oh, they're not observing the Sabbath day, you know, right? Have you, you heard that before? Um, it's, it's, it's funny because uh, we think about this idea of the Sabbath day. How can they honor God if they don't keep the Sabbath? You know, and uh, yeah, I, I, I've shared this story with you before, and I, I think it's worth sharing again. But years ago, I, 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 I've told you about my story of, of, of mowing grass on Sunday, right? And uh, some of you right now are going, oh, I can't believe it, you know. But I, so, so I, I was, I was mowing, uh, th this was back when I was a youth pastor, Crystal and I were living in the parsonage of the church. And I was mowing the, the, the grass uh, uh, for, of the parsonage on a Saturday, okay? But then a storm came in, and when the storm came in, I pulled, the, uh, I pulled the, the lawn tractor into the garage and ran in the house, man. It was just coming, coming down in sheets, you know. And so the next day, went to church, and you would have to know the guys, you know, there at the church, and they were very particular about their lawn tractors. 
and making sure that those lawn tractors got back where they were supposed to be. And so I talked to a guy named Ed. I said, Ed, you know, I, the, you know, one of the long tractors is out. I've got it in the garage over at the parsonage. And I told him what happened. And he said, we well, just bring it back over uh, today if you can. I said, sure. So as I was bringing it out, I, I thought, well, you know, there's a few strips of grass there. I need, to, I need to get that. It'll just take a few minutes. And so I just went ahead and finished mowing that grass. And then I took the lawn tractor over and uh, put it back where it needed to be, locked it up, and went home, didn't think anything about it. Well, a few days later, uh, Dr. Bowman, Pastor Bowman, you met him uh, now, Pastor Bowman came to my office and he said, Craig, he said, were you mowing grass on Sunday? And I said, yes, sir. But I told him, I told him what happened. He said, well, I, I was talking with Glenn Peacher. And he said, Glenn Peacher, the man in the church, he said, he was driving by your house or driving by the parsonage when you're out there cutting grass, and he saw you, and he said he got very offended by it. And matter of fact, he got so offended that he said he's not coming back to church. Now, I'll be honest with you, you know, that, that kind of got me riled up a little bit at first, you know, because all these different thoughts start going through your head. You might, you might say, well, Pastor, I'll be honest with you, I kind of agree with Glenn. Okay, and that's okay if you feel that way. You know, just don't, if you really do feel that way and it's a conviction, just make sure you don't go to the restaurant when you leave here today, right? Or stop by Walmart or any other convenience store or go get any gas or anything like that if you really, really feel that way and it's a conviction, right? Because we can be pretty hypocritical about that if we want to. Right? It, well, I, you know, I won't do that because I'm spiritual. But I still need somebody to serve me at the restaurant. Right? So I could have said to Glenn, you know, Glenn, actually the Sabbath was on Saturday. You know? Just saying. Or I, I could have said, you know, you know, Glenn, Colossians 2 and verse 16 says, let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths. Or I could have said, Glenn, I actually love mowing grass, so really it wasn't like work for me. It was like going to Disney World or something. You know what I mean? Uh, or I, I could have said, Glenn, I, I am a pastor in the church. What do you think we do on Sundays? Right? I mean, I, I know pastors only work one day a week, right? Okay. But that day is, is Sunday, right? So anyway, I'm just kidding. But, but you might say, you know, well, boy, Pastor, you could have really, you could have really let them have it. You know, you could have really let them have it. So what did you do? What do you think I did? That's exactly right. I called Glenn. I said, Glenn, I am so sorry that I offended you. I don't normally cut grass on Sundays. I, you know, I usually cut it on Saturday. But, but, but this is what happened, and this is why I did it. But, Glenn, I promise you that will never happen again. You will never see me cut grass again on a Sunday. Okay? I'll do it at nighttime. No, I'm just kidding. But, um, but no, I, I, it'll, never, it'll never happen again. And I said, I, will you forgive me? Will you forgive me? Well, I, you know, preacher, I, I just don't believe you should cut grass on Sunday. I know, I know, Glenn, I'm so sorry. Will you forgive me? Well, yeah, I'll, I'll forgive you. Okay. You know what happened? The next Sunday, Glenn was in church. Now, listen to me. This is important. Did I have the liberty to cut the grass, yes or no? But I could have lost my brother. And the question is, was it worth losing my brother over? And the answer to that is no. It's not. And so let me just give you a few thoughts here as we close. You know, St. Augustine said, in essentials, we should have unity. In non-essentials, liberty 
and in all things charity. So you might say, well, pastor, what do you think, what, what is an essential? I would say an essential is who God is, the dependability of Scripture, salvation by grace through faith, the importance of repentance, you know, what, what is sin? You know, those are things that impact your eternal destiny. I would say that those are essentials. You might say, well, what is a non-essential? I don't know, maybe something like the beliefs of, you know, the gifts of the Spirit. You know, some people, some Christians have different beliefs about which gifts are for today, which ones are not for today, and things like that. So I, I would maybe look at that as a non-essential. Uh, entertainment choices, clothing choices, things like that. Those are, those are not uh, essentials. I would consider those as non-essentials. And then all things charity, be charitable, be redemptive right? Be redemptive. You know, there are times where God has put a sword in our hand. And, you know, if you, if you have a sword, then you want to learn how to be a swordsman or a swordswoman, right? But you need to, you want to learn how to how to use this word of God. And instead, you know, sometimes we beat people over the head like this is not a sword, but it's a sledgehammer, right? And we'll do battle with somebody and we'll beat people up with the Bible and then we'll come away and say, I won, I won. And then next week it's like, oh, where's so-and-so? Well, I don't know. But I won. Yeah, you won. You won the battle, but you lost the war because now that person is not here in a place where they can be discipled and grow in Christ anymore. So what did you really win? And so I believe that Paul is saying that as mature believers, we must sometimes sacrifice our own personal desires. Listen, for the good of those who are less mature in Christ, even, listen, even when you haven't done anything wrong. And so let me just, let me share what this looks like. Okay, and we're going to close. What can we do? What can we do? You might want to write these things down. Okay, first of all, be willing to temporarily give up certain freedoms until your weak brother or sister becomes more mature. Now that's hard. Right? That's hard. Well, okay, uh, pastor, I'll do it, but how long do I have to wait? I don't know. Because I don't know how long it's going to take them to become more mature. So you, you have to be flexible on that. Next, reserve some freedoms for when you are in a different setting. You may have to be more reserved in a church setting because weaker Christians are present. Because remember, you might say, oh, well, that's, you know, that's, is that just situational ethics? Are you just, are you just saying you can do something here, but you, you know, if you're somewhere else, you can do something different? Well, it, it would only be situational ethics if you're doing something wrong. But you're not doing anything wrong. But you're just simply trying to be thoughtful of believers who are not mature in their faith. So you might have to save some of your freedoms or reserve those freedoms when you're in a different setting. Reserve some freedoms for when you are with close friends that know your heart and, and spiritual maturity. Listen, uh, this is important as well, though. Make sure your brother or sister in Christ is not using their own pet peeves to try to change you. See, that's different. It's one thing to be dealing with somebody who is an immature believer, and they don't know any better. It's another thing when the person knows better and they just don't like something that you're doing, and so they want to try to change you by saying, well, that offends me, you know, when really it's just, a, it's just a personal pet peeve. Next, make sure your freedoms really are freedoms and in no way violate Scripture because it could be that you or, you or I were actually wrong. If we examine Scripture on whatever that thing is that these, this person is upset or offended about, make sure that you're not wrong scripturally. And then I need to say this in closing. Again, always assume the best and think the best about people. 
Can I tell you something? When you, when you, when you go around thinking the worst about people, that is a horrible way to live your life. I'm serious. You, I, you need to grab a hold of that right there. Because if, if, if all you do is think the worst of people, then every time, like somebody does something, you know, and, and you don't know whether what they're, you don't know their motivations for what they're doing, you're going to, in your mind, assign a motivation to them. And it's not going to be a good one. You're going to assign, I bet you they're doing this. I bet you that this. I bet you that. And you're assigning motivations and you have no idea whatsoever what that person is thinking in their mind. And I mentioned this in the last service, you know, we look at people and they're doing something and we say, oh, that thing that they're doing, it's biblically wrong. That's wrong. Maybe you're right. Maybe it is wrong. But let me ask you a question. When you became a Christian, did the Lord say to you, did the Holy Spirit of God say to you, now I want you to know you're doing this wrong, 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 and I want it all cleaned up by tomorrow. Right? God didn't do that with you. What did God do? The Holy Spirit said to you, hey, you know what? This thing that you're doing here, this, this is not right. This does not please me. I want you to work on this. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, and in time you worked on that thing, and, and you, grew, you grew in that area, and maybe that area is not, it's not a, a problem for you now. And so God said, okay, now we're going to work on this. And, and now we're going to work on this, right? So you might see somebody that's doing something that's not right, but maybe God's not working on them about that thing yet because he's working with them on something else. And so just be thoughtful before you approach somebody to tell them what they're doing wrong. And make sure that if you do talk to somebody, the Bible says to speak the truth in love, right? So if we're coming at somebody and we're, you know, you're, that's not the right spirit. That's a judgmental spirit. And, and Paul said we don't have the right to judge another one's servant or God's servant. So you make sure that you speak the truth in love and that you talk to people with a loving heart so that they understand that you're not trying to be better than they are or, or more you know, holier than thou, but that you genuinely care about them and you care about their, their Christian growth. So I'm going to ask the praise team if they would come at this time. And, and let me just say this, you know, the scripture tells us not to let our good be evil spoken of. And so let's make sure that we live in such a way that no one would question our love and commitment to God and in the end, we need to understand that living our lives to love and glorify God is what matters more than anything we do.